This video is a technical video about this. Can I call this an antique? It's a vintage uh, electronic device. And right from the beginning, I know that uh, I'm making this video. It's going to be demonetized because it's going to contain keywords. There's no way to talk about this without mentioning keywords involving vaping. Electronic cigarettes, that's it. The monetization has gone in the video. It's what happens. But the video is not promoting vaping. It's about the technology contained in this really old pack. And I'm talking, I think I bought this in 2009. And by electronic cigarette standards, this is an antique. And the interesting thing about this one is it was uh, it used these little cartridges, which will, I'll open one of these cartridges up to show you how they work because it has, uh, it'll inspire to other techniques that could use a similar technology. But uh, I'll also open up the device itself to show how it detects the, uh, the airflow. And I'll also show you the device that converted that, combined the two to actually create the vivar. Note that this screws in to the cigarette packet. It's designed to emulate a traditional packet of cigarettes because when you want to charge it, let me put the lid on so nothing falls out here, you slide this little thing over here and these prongs pop out. Right, tell you what, I'm going to have to plug it in there. Let me bring in a very, very sooty death adapter and plug it in. And I'll bring in the hoppy. The happy. And we'll see how much power this thing takes. I shall wipe the dust off the hoppy and we'll plug it in a little red light lights. Presumably that goes green or goes out. Can't really remember. I can unscrew the thing and it'll show. Uh, it's drawing pretty much bang on one watt. Uh, 12 milliamps per power factor 0.347. It's a little switch mode power supply, I think. I hope. Maybe it's a capacitive dropper. I don't know. We'll find out when we open it. Uh, just out of interest, what happens if I do unscrew this? Does it? This will be the equivalent of it floating high. I have to grab the bits I just tested that with. Is it going to go green? Oh, it is, but it's a very, very dull uh, gallium phosphide green. It's virtually invisible. Oh, that's a bit cheap and tacky. That might be that uh, little trick they do where the green is lit all the time. It gets swamped by the red. Right. Let's open it. But first of all, I'll tip these little cartridges out, right? And I'll show you what they came with. This was just an early concept. This was in the early days. This is when Ryan were pioneering electronic cigars and things like that. And uh, there were lots of experimental things being done. It turned out this was not the best way to do things, but they evolved uh, to what we have today. Just the early days, I'm just loading these in. I don't need to load all these in, but the idea was you had your little... Uh, pack of cartridges uh, and when you pulled it out like this there was a little thumb thing so you could actually take one out and plug it in. All right, tell you what, let's uh, pop the inside of this out. I need a pin, like an LED lead perhaps, to push down in there. Is this going to pop out? It might not pop out. It just popped out. What we have inside, I'll zoom down in this. We have a little uh, plastic capsule filled with liquid. Oh, it's leaky. Uh, there's a foil front to this, and then there's a, a little spongy, spongy bit of material, just loose fibre inside just to hold it and stop it pouring out everywhere. And when you push this in, it physically perforated that foil and went blip. And then the device itself has this mesh that basically, like, imagine steel wool, but just crushed, quite solid. Uh, crushed to make it sort of hard and spiky, but also porous. And it wicked it down to a piece, it, this is wedged in on a piece of uh, fiberglass, I think, wick, with the uh, heating coil wound round it. I shall show you that. I'll draw it out afterwards. This is going to squirt stuff everywhere. I don't even know if it's nicotine based or not. I haven't a clue. Let's take a look at the charger, because that's quite interesting. It's quite stylish. So, rubbing the front of this, I'm looking for screw holes. I think that's a screw hole. That's a screw hole. I think that's it. If those are screw holes, let's just peel the label off. That will reveal what's underneath this. It's very stylish. There is a screw hole there. Oh, actually, there's another screw down there. Right here. Let's open it up. I thought this was pretty cool at the time. I don't smoke. I don't really vape. Occasionally, I'll do it just for the novelty value. But uh, I had lots of fun showing this to friends because these things had not been seen yet. They were just happening in Japan and China and they hadn't really come to the UK yet. So there's a high novelty factor. 
this pops up, revealing a circuit board with a single transistor. Oh my. The little slide-out contact assembly, well here's the slide-out contacts that just rub against these uh, springy contacts here. Right, tell you what, uh, and there's the contact, right, tell you what, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to reverse engineer this. I'll be back in one moment. The power supply has been reverse engineered. Here is the front of it flipped so it matches what's in the back, which is all surface mount. The isolation is staggering, I mean, obviously. I don't really 100% trust that little transformer as having proper isolation between, between the windings, as with many of these things. But, you know, they've actually made a decent effort. So it's divided into the, uh, the sort of main side of the power supply and then the low-voltage output side. Uh, we've just got a single transistor and it's using a very simple technique where the voltage and the output is echoed on the the input side, the primary side, by a feedback winding that doesn't just drive the transistor but also uh, pumps a capacitor up to a, a matching voltage level to the other side which is then used to regulate this side. Uh, I shall show you it as a schematic, We shall, because that's going to be so much easier than trying to explain it on this very cluttered PCB. So I shall zoom down onto this. Here's the incoming supply, the mains, the AC. It goes via a 1 ohm resistor and a single diode to a 4.7 microfarad 400 volt capacitor. 400 volt. That is not the pen I normally use. I shall, uh, I think that one's Kind of worn down, this one's better. That then goes to the one end of the primary winding, which then goes to the transistor. Uh, what was the transistor again? Let me just remind myself what this is. It's a 13001. That's very common in these. 13001. And then on the emitter of that transistor, which is a standard NPN transistor, well, a fairly high voltage NPN transistor, is a 100 ohm resistor. I shall explain what that's for in a moment. When the circuit initially powers up, current flows through this 1 mega ohm resistor, and this 200 ohm resistor and starts turning this transistor on. When it starts turning on, it induces current, a uh, couple's current, uh, that's flowing through this primary winding into the secondary, but also the feedback winding. The feedback winding, when this is turning on, goes positive at this end with respect to the, the zero volt rail, and current flows through this 100, 100 ohm resistor and this capacitor, which rations the amount of current that can flow, to the base of the transistor turning on much harder. At a certain point, if the current that goes through through the, going through this is too high, the uh, voltage across this 100 ohm resistor will rise high enough that uh, the base voltage doesn't really affect it. It basically starts turning the transistor off. And when it turns off, the magnetic field in this collapses. That's the point the power is actually going through this diode and charging up the output capacitor. But it's also the point that this diode here is actually charging this capacitor negatively with respect to the zero volt rail here. So this is about uh, 350 volts. And this is about plus, And this is about the zero volt, but referenced means. So it charges this capacitor negatively. So that as the voltage on this side rises, the voltage in this capacitor will rise. And what that means is that when this is trying to turn this transistor on, this senior diode is such that when that has been charged negatively enough, it's effectively dropping below the zero volt rail. This will start conducting. It'll actually pull the base down and it'll act as a sort of regulation. It's very simple. There's no fail safe in. If the, the way these things tend to fail is with a bit of a bang. It's just super simple circuitry. It's about the easiest they could get. It's very cheap and nasty. But then, end result of that is we've got a 6 volt supply going out. Then other part of the circuitry, that is the part of the circuitry over here, is two things. It's a voltage regulator, it's a very, very crude voltage regulator. And it controls the two LEDs. The, they've done that trick again. The green LED, high value resistor, it's not a very bright LED in the first place. Uh, it, it's lit all the time. But when it's charging, the red LED swamps that out. It creates a 4.5 volt reference out to the e-sig. 
via this 150 ohm resistor going to a Zener diode. The Zener diode feeds the base of that uh, transistor there. And that pretty much means that depending on the voltage uh, here, where the transistor will conduct, it's related to the voltage, roughly a 0.6 volt difference between the base and the output. So you just choose this Zener diode to match the voltage. There is a 30 ohm resistor. Is that a 30 ohm resistor? Three, zero, and a zero is a multiplier. It is a 30 ohm resistor. Which serves to do two things. It limits the current flowing through this into the vaping device. But it also uh, generates a voltage across it depending on how much current is flowing. And when that voltage is greater than 0.6 volts, this uh, transistor is effectively turned off. But... Uh, uh, sorry, when it's greater than uh, 0.6 volts, this transistor, it pulls it below the positive rail by that 0.6 volts, turns this on, and the red charging LED lights at very high intensity because it's got a 1K resistor and it's also a bright LED. As the charge comes to completion, this will gradually fade out. No decisive thing, just when it gets roughly near the, the point that the current's uh, reducing, then uh, that will ultimately just turn that off and you'll be able to see the green LED again. The e-cig, I'm not sure what's in it. I guess there's one way to find out. So let's uh, take a look at the last picture I've got here, which is how the vapour, the liquid, is carried down. So when you push the cartridge onto the top of the spikes, then the spikes penetrate into the liquid via the film, and the liquid is soaked down through this compressed mesh along this wicking material, and then there's a heating element which is fed from the outer connection and from the inner connection and just wrapped around that. And that's the bit that the liquid is based on glycol. And uh, when you heat it up, because glycol always has a certain element of water in it, it's very hard to get completely dry glycol. It's uh, extremely hygroscopic. Now I've broken the seal, this thing will actually probably start gradually oozing because it absorbs a lot of water from the air. But what happens is that as this is heated up, the water has a much lower boiling point than the glycol. So although it's all mixed together as water and glycol, when the water boils, it shatters the glycol apart into lots of tiny little droplets. And those little droplets floating in the air are what creates that fog and also carries the other ingredients across to stimulate the vaping people. Right. Okay. I'm going to pause momentarily. Uh, I'm going to restart the video just so I can get a nice clean start on taking this apart. One moment, please. Right, it's time to take the cigarette device. So we'll zoom in on this and I shall get a pair of pliers and I suppose I could try and get this end off. Can I get this end off here without nipping my fingers? Wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. The cap has come off. I can see a little circuit board with LEDs up the end. Well, an LED and a capacitor. I think I'm going to have to take this end off, so let's wiggle this. Keep in mind, oh, that's crumbling. That's not helpful. That is definitely not helpful. Oh, am I going to short out this little lithium cell in here? Probably. This is not going well. Oh, that's just pulled that wire off. That that didn't go well. But not to worry. This sometimes happens. Right, tell you what. Can I gingerly poke this out by ramming a screwdriver down the end into a lithium cell? Yeah, right, okay, that's good. That's uh, not a great approach to this. You foolish bear. What have we got? What system is it using? Hmm, this doesn't really want to come out. Tell you what, let's cut the wires off so I can diffuse this little lithium beam. So I'll cut that wire and that wire. That's it relatively safe-ish. And this. Technically speaking, I then pull the lithium cell out. No, I'm just pulling the little tab off the lithium cell. It's in there tight, but this is what we want to see. Is it the, I don't think, it's not the one that's using the original uh, air pressure sensing. It's using the thing that looks, at, it's quite advanced then, but it's not the latest. It's using what looks like a little uh, 
microphone, but if I remember correctly, that microphone type thing, all we've got in the back here is a LED and a capacitor, but uh, this little microphone thing isn't a microphone. It's the same case as a microphone, but it will contain a little transistor inside, a little MOSFET, a chip optimised to this task, and if I unfurl this metal strip of it, there will simply be a diaphragm and spacer, so that as you draw a vacuum, it pulls the little mylar layer up to the point it touches the front, and that tells the little chip inside, which I don't see. There's a little mylar uh, disc there that I've just basically dropped. It is, it's the, it's the slightly translucent, well, it's kind of, you can see through it. It's metalized mylar, and it's the one that as you draw the pressure, it touches the other bit. Oh, I see what they've done here. That's quite weird. This is an intermediate design. It's got two pins. I've not seen this one before. They've got a chip on board, a tiny little blob chip, though that spells all the fun. In later models, they just got rid of this completely. They had the little microphone type thing and the circuit board in the back that the wires are coming out of. See this little circuit board here? Inside the little microphone thing, it's not a microphone, just a pressure sensor, they had the little chip, the MOSFET and the control circuit all built into one. Um, and on the back of the circuit board, they had the LEDs that they have on here. So this is an intermediate design. So I wonder if it does have any charge control or if that 4.5 volts was basically just charging the lithium cell via a diode. Hmm. Not knowing which of these connections was which doesn't really help now. Uh, let me think. I shall probe this. One moment, please. Yeah, that looks like it's just going through a diode. Possibly the the natural diode that is formed inside a MOSFET. That's a wild guess, because I can't really say much when there's just a blob there. Uh, right, tell you what, let me just try and doodle something out that kind of makes sense. Here are my thoughts, and I could be wrong here. Let's just uh, focus down onto that. If this is the inside of the e-cig, it's got the pressure switch feeding to the control circuit, which is under that blob with its, MOS with its MOSFET actually built in, but that MOSFET's there as well. Then if that's the lithium positive, and this is the negative, uh, then the... The MOSFET could actually be either side here. It could be a P-channel or N-channel MOSFET. But if that's the heater connection, that's also used for recharging it. If you were to apply a positive with the heater off and negative to there, then the positive would be going straight to the positive lithium cell, but the negative could go via this uh, diode, this parasitic diode that always just happens to be across MOSFETs. Uh, and that would then allow the current to flow through and charge that cell, which could explain that 4.5 volts, because it's basically they've played safe then. It's, it's dropping about 0.5 volts or so across this uh, diode, so that would charge the lithium cell up to about 4 volts-ish. Uh, that's just a thought, though. Not really sure what they're doing in there, because that little blob is hiding an awful lot. But that is it. That's the complete thing stripped to bits. I have no intention of using this little thing, particularly with these cartridges, because they're they're pretty old, but it was quite a nice design. It was quite a functional and sort of cleverly styled design, but I really don't think these these days you wouldn't really have one this size because everybody wants a sort of vaping device that is going to last for much longer on the battery than the tiny little lithium cell that's used in these. They're, you find the same sort of lithium cell in the disposable ones. It's not got high capacity. Uh, but there we go. That is it. The thing has been stripped to bits. We have gained the knowledge that we wanted from the inside of the flimsy little power supply and uh, the little, how the liquid is fed down to the uh, the actual the heater, how the liquid comes from those cartridges is atomized by the heat, and uh, how the cigarette itself is recharged. I think that's it. That's uh, not bad. Quite an interesting and stylish little unit.